Welcome back to This is Live, the Sunday talk show here on Arise News. Still with me in the studio, I have Professor Bola Akintenewa, Director General of the Center for International Diplomacy and Strategic Studies. Chike Ogea, former Commissioner for Information, Data State, and Yemi Adamolekun, Executive Director, Enough is Enough. Well, I mean, Yemi and uh, gentlemen uh, here with me, we've had uh, for about an hour as our special guest, the governor of Ikiti State, Dr. Karade Fayemi, uh, speaking on a range of issues, from value-added tax to Petroleum Industry Act, to issues in his own state, to, you know, security issues in Nigeria and other matters of interest. And I would like to have your take on, uh, you know, some of his uh, submissions. I'd like to start with you, uh, Yemi Adama Lokon. Okay, Yemi Adama Lokon has not yet joined us, so I'll start with you, Chike Ogea. Well, I listened um, <laughs> with rapt attention, and um, obviously, uh, Governor Fayemi did not disappoint. He's a friend of mine, I know him very well, very cerebral. And, um, he has a PhD in war studies. Yeah, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> and um, obviously, you know, up to date and um, hands on the plow with what he's doing. Like you said, he, he went through a gamut of issues. You know, the important ones to me was um, his comments he said about the president in the UN. He agrees that, yes, at a time like now, uh, Nigeria should be considered for the debt service um, suspension initiative, basically because of what has happened with COVID, um, with a lot of this. You know, this takes me back many years when um, I was working with Chief Asiodo, and um, part of what we were doing then was um, reconciling the debt. You know, over the years, the military never sp talked to these bilateral institutions, and it wasn't until Obasanjo came in 99 that, you know, the real debt negotiations began. And there was that initiative called the Highly Indebted Poor Countries, HIPIC. And um, a lot of countries, about 80-something countries, I think maybe about 73 now, um, were due to have, you know, debt um, uh, cancellation for various reasons. And, of course, Nigeria came under that initiative. And that was one of the initiatives that helped a lot. So if um, in the situation we are in now, according to what um, Governor Fayemi was saying, uh, we are actually using these um, um, debts that are mounting uh, for capital projects, especially projects that can pay, you know, maybe things like the railway and all of that. That's what he's saying. And his, his contention is that, no, we haven't been using these monies for consumption because... No, but that, that is not true. Uh -huh. So you see, that is the problem. If really we've been borrowing for consumption, then we are in big trouble because what we are doing is that um, we, are borrow we are mortgaging the future of our children and um, we, are, we are creating a problem for tomorrow, which should definitely not be what we're looking at. Um, again, he looked at the situation of um, the Southern Governors uh, uh, Forum and what they had said about the open grazing and all of that. Uh, he, he tried to be a nationalist there. He said he was the uh, chairman of the Governor's Forum <laughs> and he cannot comment on what a subsect of that forum is doing. But the truth is that um, Governor Erufai missed it, definitely. Uh, I think he should concentrate more on the situation in the state and how he can arrest it. I know he's a progressive, uh, irrespective of where he comes from or what his religion is. I know he's also a very intelligent man. And I know he has been taking steps to, you know, start ranching and all of that in Kaduna State. So really, I don't see why, you know, he was brewing that tea in a, in a teapot, as far as I'm concerned, by even bothering himself with what the governors are doing in the South. Let the governors take care of their states. Let them do what they think is best for their people, and he should do the same. And, you know, everybody should just, as they say, paddle their canoe. Um, but one of the disappointing things for me which came out of that whole uh, mix of the Governor's Forum of the South, was when this meeting was actually held in Enugu, if I, if I remember, the Governor of Enugu State hosted it, and the Governors of the South it were missing. 
governors that will go from one from, of them attended the, the, only one the host one. governor obviously yes the, definitely one. that's what i'm saying what happened to governor of abia governor of imo that were all around the corner you see there are certain things that are beyond politics and this is what my people miss when i mean my people that's what the igbos miss they for, they seem to forget that and you see if the igbo leadership is behaving the way they are behaving and at the same time they are talking about uh, presidency in 2023, they better know that that whole contention is dead on arrival. Because you see, the people that are even taking this presidency for the Igbos in 2023 are not the leaders of the Igbos. They are is the more of the intelligentsia, more of the maybe business class. Yeah, you know. So it, it's it's a pity they have to go and get that connection back to their political class. Because you see, this is like you. You are a spectator in a football game and you think you can influence it when you're not on, in, on the field. It is the players there that are going to determine what's going to happen. So they are going to have a, a problem and they will be trying to hold on to straws by blaming other people because I, I read somewhere they were already trying to pass the buck and say, okay, the Yorubas are talking about them going for presidency. Why should they be doing that? Of course, the Yorubas have a right to talk about them going for presidency. You talk about your own and let them talk about their own. Okay. And when the time comes, you all go for your negotiations and everybody comes in with their own cards. Okay. And whoever has the best cards will be dealt their hand. Chike, before we move on, your commentary yes. on... Uh Ekiti at uh, 25. Is madam from Ekiti? No, no, no. No, <laughs> but I know you have a Yoruba wife. I, my wife is from Ogun State, so <laughs> let's not even get there. <laughs> anyway, we were talking to her. Yes, over to you. You are very the, close to uh, Ekiti State. The totality of uh, Dr. Fayemi's uh, submissions, um, I think, is predicated on not being the friend of one and the enemy of the other. So he tried as much as possible to tow the middle line, looking for arguments for and against as convenient. Um, let me draw attention to, first of all, the alleged um, federal road from Ekiti to Akure. From Ado, Ado to Akure. Yeah, from Ado to Akure. I know the road very well. Now, while the efforts of um, the governor are commendable for providing alternative routes, my problem is this issue of federal road, state road. People are suffering. Then the federal government can afford the luxury of saying, look, you cannot do this, and even if you do, we will not refund you, and you cannot pull a toll there. You do not want, uh, you just want to make life difficult for, for a constitutive state of Nigeria. They are going to take um, loan development assistance from either the African Development Bank and so on and so forth. Why should any federal government, for God's sake, not be happy that you have a state that is taking initiative to uh, mitigate the problems of people. I think this is why we need to address this issue of federalism very well. We should do away with um, a state um, having roots, the federal government having um, roots. Now, we have um, the issue of uh, Fani Kayode. He said it is a freedom of association. But what we are simply saying is that Fani Kayode made some public pronouncements. And you said, look, you will never do this over your dead body. And then later on, you now come back to do precisely what you told the whole world. Those are the things we are talking about. Well, on that I note, uh, Professor Akintene, well, we need to take a short break. Yeah, on this day live, the Sunday talk show. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Welcome back to this day live, the Sunday talk show here on the Arise Things channel. I see you have with me in the studio, Professor Bola Akintenua, Director General Bully Tax Center for International Diplomacy and Strategic Studies. 
Chike Ogea, former Commissioner for Information, Data State, and Yemi Adamolekun, Executive Director, Enough is Enough. Well, Yemi, are you with us right now? Uh, okay, I'll come back to you later, uh, Yemi Adamolekun. Prof, I'll come back to you uh, in, in a minute. If we could just summarize your submissions on some of the uh, points raised by Governor Kayode Fayemi of Ikiti State. Two quick points. Dr. Fayemi said that um, the southern governors and um, El Rufai, they are both correct. They are not wrong. I do not share his view on that. He was trying to panel beat the issue. What the southern governors are saying, what Akredolu was saying, he is quarreling with uh, many statements made. El Rufai said, the law you have made it cannot be implemented, one, and that we will see whether you will be able to implement that. That in itself is infuriating. Those are the issues. We are not talking about um, um, getting support or trying to organize a grazing something. There are many state, uh, statements made that are very, very provocative, and that is from that perspective we should look at it. The other one, he, he rightly pointed out that uh, the president made a good speech at the, at the UN. I agree with him, not for the reasons he gave, but for completely different reasons. You know, this um, debt service uh, suspension um, initiative was put in place in 2020 by the G20. And um, it actually provides for countries in difficulties to apply and be qualified to be eligible, all right? And um, 73 countries have been um, noted. What uh, PMB is now asking for is expansion of the criteria to include virtually all developing countries, all uh, countries, uh, the small islands, and so on and so forth. So in this case, uh, it, it portrays leadership by example, uh, not necessarily advocating for Nigeria. So in this case, um, when you look at it, the speech, although we are told by... But can you really uh, <laughs> eliminate uh, the factor of self-interest in the matter? No, you are, you are right. We are supposed to uh, make known our own um, interest. But the issue is, when you are fighting for the interests of others, logically, all along, yours will be there. You see, the, the, the beauty of it all is that the speech that was read in 2020 appears to be the best so far since 2015 to date, not this particular one. Yeah, but Plus, you know these speeches see, are the same. No, no. I mean, the I, issues that for are many raised... Years, I was part of the team. Look, signing off on that speech. I can, so I had an idea. I, I can um, <laughs> pontificate on what you have been reading. I've been studying all these speeches. The, the bottom line is that every hunger has a theme. Yes. And the uh, speeches are supposed to address the themes. Yes. So you don't frolic around talking about things that are not relevant. But for the first time since 2015, until 2020, uh, the speech addressed the theme, and it was structured in a methodological manner. Okay, so, that will be, um, you know, probably our next topic uh, for discussion. But let me bring Yemi Adamalekun into the conversation. Yemi Adamalekun is not yet ready, so we we'll take the next topic. Yeah, President Muhammad Buhari has informed the National Assembly of his proposal to make some amendments to the Petroleum Industry Act 2021. This came exactly 37 days after the act was enacted. In the proposed amendment, President Buhari is seeking an appointment of non-executive board members for the two regulatory institutions in the sector. Removal of the Ministries of Petroleum and Finance from the board of the two institutions and the appointment of executive directors. In a letter he sent to the National Assembly, and which was read on the floor of the Senate, the President said, these amendments are proposed 
in the interest of our national unity. Uh, Chike, in the interest of our national unity. One of the issues where, you know, that uh, uh, Governor Fayemi addressed. Because the contentious issues relate to the expectations of the host communities. Uh, the 30% allocated to uh, the uh, frontier business. Uh, but the president, in seeking these amendments, seems to be more interested in administrative, you know, um, allocation of positions uh, and definition of uh, tenure, uh, rather than the, those questions that came to the fore immediately the Petroleum Industry Act was assented to. Well, if you ask me, what I think is that maybe because those questions you're talking about are already settled. You know, really? Yes, because um, he is the one that will put his pen to, you know, on, um, to, 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 to pass that bill into an act. And if he feels that, okay, yes, there are issues with, you know, the, the, the regulatory aspect of the bill. And, you know, I'm particularly very happy when I saw that, that um, PMB, as Prof always calls him, is actually looking at um, the, the, the Federation and thinking about federal character. That, that's heartwarming to me. I wish he could, be, he could, um, he could um, do that in all his other appointments as well. So if that is the basis on which it says, hey, let's look at this and let's um, sort this out so that there's equal representation in the whole country, which is what we all expect, then to, my, to that extent, you know, I think that is fair, that is fine. I'll concede that to him. Um, I'm sure, like I said, if that was the case in most of the things he's doing, he, you know, there'll be less rancor and... Most of these agitations we are seeing here and there, there'll be less of it, you know. But coming to what you said, which is the meat of the, of the bill, I think maybe the only thing that would be in contention would be those percentages which they want to give to the host community, which I think already the people from my own zone are already kicking against. And we're saying it is not enough knowing the kind of degradation and all the, the spoilation we suffer as a result of this commodity being in our, in our backyard. And yet, you know, we don't have the full benefit of it. We, we bear this brunt, and these monies are taken to Abuja and shared, you know. Yes, they give us some form of derivation formula, but even with that, you know, we know that with the, with the challenges we have, that can never be enough. So to, to my mind, I, I don't mind. I don't have a problem with all of that. Um, let him you know, look at the whole totality of the bill. And just like Governor Fayemi also said, bills, acts, even when they become acts, are also work in action. They, they, they can still be, you know, worked upon. They can be, that's why there are always amendments. It's just that Nigeria is such a complicated place that to ever achieve any simple amendment to anything, you know, all sorts of considerations of religion and ethnicity and all that will come into it and complicate a very simple matter. Yeah, I get your point, uh, Chike, but yes. look, the key concern of many stakeholders is that given the opera, outrage, you know, uh, against some of the provisions in the Petroleum Industry Act as passed, yes. many would have expected that President Buhari, in proposing amendments, will have addressed the concerns of the people. I agree you with know, you. Just to assuage their fears. I agree with you. And make sure that there is a sense of ownership mm -hmm. yes. across constituencies. But, but, but that did not happen. Ruben, uh, quickly, before I see the floor to Prof, <laughs> this is the sixth year of this administration. When has President Buhari ever done that? So why we are we expecting that now? Well, that, uh, okay. <laughs> Maybe from addition, we will help you answer that. Maybe. Course. I don't want to assist him in that. <laughs> that we'll take job. a short break again <laughs> here on this Elaine Sunday talk show. When we return, the conversation will continue. Welcome back to this Elaine Sunday talk show here on the Arise News channel. Still with me, I have Professor Bola Akintenwa. Director General Bully Tax Center for International Diplomacy and Strategic Studies. Chiki Ogia, former Commissioner for Information, Data State, and Yemi Adamolekun, Executive Director in Office in Yemi, good to have you with us right now. 
just before we took uh, that break, that last break, uh, we were talking about President Muhammad Buhari and his uh, amendments, proposed amendments to the National Assembly on the Petroleum Industry Act. And there seems to be some kind of consensus out here that the amendments is seeking, uh, talking about board appointments, tenure of appointments, and the nature of appointments do not go far enough. Then what do you think? Thank you, and my apologies. I have a VPN on my computer that was messing up my connection. I'll leave PIA for interest of time. I'll leave amendments to the PIA to Mr. Ogia and Professor Akintewa. And I just really want to speak to what Governor Fayemi spoke about, I think, because I believe some of the issues he raised really talks, highlights yeah, this constant conversation question. about. Let her come. Sorry? Please go ahead, Yemi. Thank the, you. the guys in the studio here, yeah, they are saying, why is she taking us back? We already said to that man. Okay, your views are important. I'm, I'm just yeah, I'm just contributing. I'm not taking us back. Yeah, continue with P, P, the petroleum industry. Please and that's why I'll, I'll see the flow on that. Yeah, go ahead. I, don't, I, don't need to contribute. I don't need to contribute on that. But I believe the issues that in your discussion with Dr. Fayemi really speaks to this whole conversation about devolution of powers and restructuring as they are used synonymously. He talked about tax and the fact that it is within the purview of the states to collect tax, that our tax collection um, regime was efficient and it, need, it needed to be changed. And again, as I said last week, the fact that the federal government was trying to amend the constitution is clear sort of admission that it's not a federal, it's not a federal role. Again, the issue of the states having more power. He talked about revenue when we were talking about borrowing. And though, as the other two gentlemen had said, I do disagree with him that, yes, it's good to borrow for infrastructure development, for uh, infrastructure, for economic development, but we are borrowing for consumption. And it, I'm sorry, you can't separate the fact that 97% of our revenue will go to debt services from the good of borrowing. Nobody is saying borrowing is bad, but we can't take away Nigeria borrowing away from Nigeria's macroeconomic policy, our exchange rate regime, which is rubbish, and the fact that, as you say, planes come in and can't go out of the country with goods because it doesn't make any sense for them to take it because it's so expensive. I think what they say will cost $30,000 here will cost only $4,000 in Ghana. So we can't separate them, but I do agree with him that it's good to borrow for infrastructure development. So we've talked about tax, then there's this revenue bit and the need for states we have 36 states. Some of them are not viable. I mean, I, I with respect for Dr. Fayemi, but Ikiti was carved out, out, out of Undo. My running joke is that we're going to annex them back because Ikiti is not a viable state. And let's be, let's be clear about that. So when we begin to look at these things, um, the under Yowande Sadiku, the Nigerian Investment Promotion Commission started publishing a book of states, just looking at our different states. What do they have? How can they increase their IGR? Budgets, the non-profit as well, does an annual state of states that looks like the ability of the states to meet their obligations. And it's clear that it's not possible for all the states. So again, back to this, our conversation about devolution of powers and the viability of the states that we have. Then we talk about the road. And I'm glad he'd mentioned that road. The road goes in front of my village. And I'm glad he said he was embarrassed about it. But he nailed the point when he talked about, and I think maybe Professor Kintariwa alluded to that, that this battle between the state and the federal government on their road. I, I mean, at the point, should the concern not be there, there being a functional road that people can travel on so that they are not kidnapped and they are not, ki and they're not killed? And that's what's actually happening on that road. But we are, we are owning roads that don't work and we're not allowing states that want to fix these roads or say they will not be given their money back, the inability to do it. And I like what Dr. Fayemi said. I mean, in the absence of not having control over that road, the road where he had control over, they did fix it to serve as, a, as an alternative route. Obviously, those people whose houses, like my village, are on that road, we don't have the luxury of going through the other way. But for those who can, at least there is, a, there is an alternative route. So I think it's actually really quite important that in all these issues, as we piece them together from different angles, tax, revenue, security, aha, he, he talked about security as well, that they will do the best they can with Amotekun in as much as they're contributing to a federal security architecture. Again, issue of devolution of powers. Amotekun was, in, was a necessity 
because the federal government is unable to secure the state. It's unable to secure its citizens, given our federal approach to security. So you have Amotekon in the southwest, a, I forget the name for the southeast, and different regions. E how do we secure e Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank How you. do we secure our citizens? So tax, revenue, security, roads are just really clear markers of why this conversation of devolution of powers is extremely necessary at this time. Thank you. Okay, yes. Thank you very much, uh, Yemi. Um, we've been waiting to have your input. Uh, but now, uh, Professor Akintenrua. Okay. The other subject about uh, PIA and uh, President uh, Buhari's uh, proposals and the concerns of the stakeholders. You see, the amendment proposal raises one critical problem. And um, I cannot imagine how PMB will uh, give assent to the bill to make it law and then immediately after, you are asking for amendment. Didn't you read, didn't you see this particular uh, uh, bill before assenting to it? I am asking this question in order to raise a uh, political uh, attitude of our president to critical national questions. I am disturbed by the fact that the people's concerns, particularly in terms of um, the three um, percent um, allocated to the host communities and the thirty percent to the the frontier uh, basins. Now, people are complaining about that. But what the president is proposing for amendment does not even touch on that. I'm expecting that, look, rather than be talking about the board, uh, tenure, membership, and so on and so forth, why wouldn't he, for God's sake, try to look at what the people are agitating for and complaining? Meaning that, look, uh, the, the, the lifestyle of um, political governance under PMB remains essentially manu military. When he decides to go along his uh, unidirectional uh, um, destination, he, he doesn't uh, listen to anyone. And I'm thinking that um, the issue of uh, simply removing Minister of Petroleum Ministry of um, Finance. Finance, all right? Uh, he saw all this before. He should have drawn attention to that. So if he really wants a, a united, a very vibrant, united country, there is the need for element of truth. We need to have confidence in our president. But when, for instance, we have to be doubting what he says, please, there is a problem there. Well, um, quickly, Ruben, if, yeah. if I may come in here. And um, that was the point I was making earlier on. It's um, 2021, and we are racing to 2023. And we've been coming for 2015. And this has been consistent, what Prof is trying to remedy here. And I am saying to you, Prof, that it's too late in the day, you know, for all of that. That is why all hands, and that is the way I'm thinking now, should be on deck as what are we bringing in. And you see, that's the painful thing to me, because I don't see any of that in the horizon now. What are we bringing in to replace this order? What is the new pre, you know, the legal order that is coming in to replace this order? That is what Nigerians should be focused on. And I think, you know, we are just not taking that seriously. The different ethnic groups, the different, you know, uh, whatever, we are still playing politics of religion and sentiments and um, ethnicity. 
you know, and well, you know, what should we do? One of the uh, proposals by Nigerians is that perhaps we should pay more attention to transparency and accountability in the electoral process. If you look at uh, this day, <laughs> newspaper front page today, there's a story there saying that uh, the uh, Independent National Electoral Commission is insisting that it, indeed it is possible to have electronic voting and that the infrastructure is in place and that it is possible to achieve that objective of uh, credible elections and integrity and transparency and accountability. But that, is the government of the day that's right. ready to ensure that? Is it not just even the government of the day, the political class? Okay. The litigious the question there yeah, yes. is the transference of the results electronically. Uh -huh. Yes, that has but been the is saying that, so, you know, it is possible. Political class across and the board. And they've done their research, and 93% of polling units in Nigeria, contrary to what we were told when that uh, Electoral Amendment Bill 2010 was being considered, can, in fact, ensure the electronic transmission of results. So this is where we are in Nigeria, at a crossroads with regard to the integrity and credibility of elections. But let's move on to the next topic, and this has to do with value-added tax. As the debate on the collection of the value-added tax continues, the Minister of Finance, Budget, and National Planning, Zainab Ahmed, has advised Nigerians to continue the payment of the VAT to Federal Tax Collecting Agency, the FIRS. In a newspaper advertorial on Thursday, the minister said the taxpaying public has been confused about who to pay VAT to as a result of the Federal High Court judgment and therefore directed the FRS to continue VAT collection until the court rules otherwise. Zainab Ahmed implored the states to stop all litigations regarding VAT collection in the interest of the nation's economy, which is not in a good shape. At the moment, the River State Governor, Yesom Buke, has started the VAT debate when he argued that the state and not the federal government should be the one collecting the tax. Still on VAT. So it's not just the Minister of Finance and Budget and National Planning. Even the Federal Inland Revenue Service itself uh, has been insisting that, look, the status uh, Co antebellum should be maintained. The Office of the Attorney General also insists that uh, you know it's a constitutional thing for the federal government to collect value-added tax, which is a consumption tax. And the states have said no. In in the real sense of it, VAT is not even under the, the exclusive uh, list. Ex exclusive list in the uh, constitution. So this is where we are. One of those issues related to fiscal federalism and restructuring in Nigeria. Yemi Adam Alekun, let me start with you. Hello, Yemi, can you hear me? Hello? Well, I mean, I made my points earlier that I think the timing of all these... I can hear you. Can yes. you hear me? Please go ahead. Okay. Right. I said I made my point earlier in the context of Dr. Fayemi's contributions that the conversations we're having around tax, revenue, security, all these things speak to the larger conversation that we refuse to have as a country around how do we work together in the interest of all of us. So again, as I said last week, the fact that FIRS tried to get this to be part of a constitutional amendment is an admission that they realize that they are not covered by the constitution in how this, this is administered. And you are right, in a lot of ways, that is can be seen as a consumption tax, even though technically it's not, but it's the need for an honest conversation. The whole trigger for this was a lawsuit in Rivers, and then other states have then followed. Lagos quickly followed with its own bill. So if I'm not mistaken, it's also what Dr. Fayemi alluded to or stated very clearly in terms of just waiting to see how the Supreme Court interprets the Constitution. I will take it from there. And I dare say that that should then be the case. As faulty as the Constitution is, it's still the law of the land. So while there's an advocacy to rewrite it, so to speak, in, in its entirety, 
it is what we will still refer to in trying to understand how we function together as uh, as, a, as as a federation, as it were. And I think this point also goes, sorry, also goes to the issue between, for example, the governor of uh, Undo that we had last week and the governor of Kaduna on this issue of, on, on gracing. Now, I love the way Dr. Faimi framed it in that they are not contradicting themselves, but in Malam trying to be a bit flippant, and I think Mr. Ogier made the point, was unnecessary in the sense that the southern governors have decided to institute a penalty. So while, and Dr. Adik, um, Governor Kerry Dolu did mention it last week as, as well, that they've begun training on how to ranch, on how to raise your cattle in different ways, and that they're members of Mieteala in Ondo states that are showing up for those trainings. So his point is that while we're doing A, we've also put in a legal mechanism to curtail bad behavior. So for Malam to sort of dismiss the legal provisions for bad behavior, I'm, I'm not quite sure I, I understand that. So again, in a federation, let every state do what is suited for its state. Governor Kerry Dolu mentioned it last week as well. Zamfara stopped a brand of what's called movement of cattle, and they've also banned interstate movement, I think, between whatever their contiguous states are. So again, that was a decision that Zamfara thought it needed to take because of its own peculiar situation and security challenges. And then the Southern governors have taken a decision they thought was important in enforcing this new move to ranching and whatever else it is. So for me, I, within this larger conversation of devolution of powers and restructuring, it was also a bit disrespectful of Dr. Um, Governor Rufai to say that what a colleague is doing in his own state's interest was not right, so to speak. Yeah. Okay, QK? Well, um, again, what we are talking about comes in the larger network of the kind of what some people say is a jaundiced federalism that we've been practicing. You know, um, it is clear, our concern is clear. Like, we have all agreed about VAT not being covered by the exclusive list. It's a pity that we really, you know, persist in doing the wrong things. And then when somebody somewhere tries to set us aright, then it all becomes litigation and then fight and all these problems. Because the framers of our constitution, Abinicio, if you ask me, have always left all these lacunas and ambiguities so that this thing can be manipulated. Now we have a situation where we have to wait for the Supreme Court to make a determination of this. The Federal Ministry of Finance, who should be busy, you know, busying themselves with the macro um, aspect of our economic... Fiscal uh, policy. And fiscal fiscal policy. policy. That's right. To complement what, what the CBN uh, governor is doing, has failed and, you know, and lacking so much in that. The Naira has been on a total free fall. Our economy is on the verge of collapse. Nobody's talking about all of that. But what they are more interested in doing is to take out a, a, a newspaper ad saying you should pay VAT that you are not supposed to pay to FIRS. To FIRS. So you see, this whole thing, it's, it's very worrying. And yet, I'm a lawyer, you know, I'm constrained. But we have to wait for the Supreme Court. You know, okay. that, that, that is Well, it. that is the position also of Michael Zekome Essien, who says that uh, the, Supreme, uh, the appeal court, the court of appeal, Having ruled that all parties concerned should return to the status, uh, status quo antebellum That's to right. stay there until the matter is resolved. But we hope that, in terms of jurisprudence, uh, that this will be an advancement. Uh, progress will be made with regard to value added tax. Professor Akintenova, your take. You see, I will continue to insist on the fact that uh, PMB cannot continue to rule Nigeria by Manu military. You cannot, we cannot say we are under democracy and then uh, you, you come with some decisions by fiat. We have states that have enacted laws. They are already laws. So even if um, um, we have um, the case pending, I think that we need to address one fundamental question. Do we really want a very strong, united Nigeria? Do we need 
a very functional um, fed, um, federalism to operate. This is the issue. I think that um, what we are going through now is the first step in restructuring. For instance, we can understand the dilemma, the headache, the stomach trouble that uh, the Minister of Finance or FIRS um, can be going through. In the past five years, for instance, uh, how much uh, did the FIRS generate? 5.60 trillion um, naira as VAT. And of this, Rivers State and uh, Lagos State accounted for um, 3.9 trillion. Now, when um, the states now go to the extent of now collecting VAT, where is the money left for the federal government? So that's why they are fighting tooth and nail to, to get um, the federal government to, to continue to collect. And this is why they want to engage in um, Magui, that is um, um, well, dishonest uh, uh, something. Uh, Professor Akintana, well, we will need to move on. And the next topic uh, should be of interest to you. <coughs> Being a professor of international relations. Chairman, are voting today in an election that will determine who gets to replace Angela Merkel after almost 16 years as Chancellor of Germany. The battle is between Merkel's center-right union bloc with State Governor Armin Laschet running for the position of Chancellor and the center-left Social Democrats led by outgoing Finance Minister Olaf Scholz. Recent surveys show the Social Democrats marginally ahead. They also show the environmentalists, Greens, who are putting forth candidate Anna Lena Bebock are in third place, several points behind. About 60.4 million people in the nation of 83 million are eligible to elect the new parliament. Well, Professor Akintero, you can see why I said I'll come back to you. Angela Merkel, first, a legacy. The de facto uh, leader of the European Union, the first female chancellor of Germany, and uh, considered, rightly, I guess, as one of the most powerful women in the world. A tenure has ended, and she does, she, she's not seeking re-election. And Germany is voting today uh, for a new leader. What's your analysis? What's your take? What do you think is going to happen in Germany? I think that the history, the historical background of uh, Angela Merkel uh, points to uh, a brighter future in the sense that whoever is going to enter into her shoes, we need really to be uh, better prepared. Uh, in other words, after uh, Conrad Adenauer, um, Helmut Schmidt, and um, Helmut Kohl, those are the two chancellors that have um, actually um, stayed longer than um, the tenure of uh, Angela. And now what she is to the whole world in terms of her ability to forge consensus, because that's the major dynamic of um, her government. So I think that we congratulate her for completing our tenure, and we wish the incoming successor our best wishes. Well, Yemi Adam Alekun, we have just about two minutes to go. This is one of the tightest elections uh, in Germany. But the more important question is, what will Germany look like without Angela Merkel? I mean, it will be very... Well, I don't know. I'm not a... I'll leave that one for Professor Akintewa. But I think the comment I really just want to make is in how much the world has changed in 16 years. When she became Chancellor of Germany, I'm not, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but there were certainly fewer women who were leading countries. And now 16 years later, there are a lot more women, even within the European Union, I think, and especially who have also been um, highlighted given their role during the pandemic last year, that countries that were led by women did a lot better than countries that were led by men. 
So, I mean, there's one woman contending two men. It will be interesting to see what the succession looks like. But um, I think she has served her country well. And I think her, her responses to a recent interview about her, her outlook on state and being the leader of a state and the, or the what's the word I'm looking for, the benefits that accrued to her and how she handled that, I think says a lot for the way we see power very differently on the African continent. And yes, uh, Yemi Adamalokun, you are very right on that point about female power. And the fact that almost a whole generation has not known any leader in Germany other than a woman. So, but... Uh, quickly, yes. Quickly, um, this has been the most powerful woman in the world for ten years. Uh, yeah, for sixteen years, she's been in um, in power, like you rightly said. Uh, she's a physicist and has a PhD in quantum uh, chemistry. I hear um, her her policy. You know what she's known for more is for policy more than politics, like they said. And she, you know, what I found intriguing about her is that she has a mixed match of a legacy. She's supposed to be an agent of modernization and also of backwardness. Why do you say that? Because you have a situation where she's done so much with refugees, you know, um, and trying to improve all these kind of things she's done. But at the same time, in areas of digitization and one or two of such areas, Germany has lagged behind. So, but basically, you know, especially with reference to her open door policy, they say she's um, a situation where she has the windows, you know, slightly tinted. In other words, she didn't slam the door against immigrants and all of that. Well, we wish uh, but, Chancellor um, Angela Merkel the very best as she moves on with her career. You've been watching This Day Live, the Sunday talk show here on Arise News. I'm Ruben Abati. From my entire team here in Lagos, it's bye for now. And thank you very much for watching. We'll see you again next Sunday.